been asked to look at this carburetor, which is a cassette, which is obviously a, a little carburetor that was used in the 20s and used on a supercharged Sarkson. But the problem is, every time you switch the fuel on, it floods, runs all over the floor. I mean, very dangerous, because if the car was to cough back and you've got a puddle underneath the car, next thing you know, you've got a serious fire. So it's very important that we get this to work properly. And having looked at it, I think the carburetor is probably original, but obviously it's donkey's years old and it's had a load of things happen in its life. And I don't think that float is probably original. All this mechanism is how it normally works. And those little things there go in there and then the float comes up and it pushes on them and it pushes the it pushes that down into there to switch the fuel off. Well, it's all very good, but to me that float looks very small. And in my experience, this mechanism, unless it's absolute perfection, which it doesn't look like it is, it don't work. And it was exactly the same on a Bugatti, because they've got a Zenith carburetor, and those Zenith carburetors had a very similar mechanism to that. And again, they were always flooding. So I altered the Bugatti carburetor when we went to methanol, because you have to get a lot of fuel through for methanol. And what I did was, I more or less copied the Amal carburetor, which is obviously on a motorbike, subject to a lot of vibration, and their method, there's no mechanism. The float goes up and shuts the fuel off. So you're not relying on all this lot, which gets worn very quickly, because you can imagine as the car's going up, along, this is going up and down, up and down continuously. So anyway, we've now decided we're going to convert it to the Amal method. And the other thing is, over the years, I've always collected any floats that I've ever seen or you know, took one out and put one in, and I've always kept them. So we've got this box of floats, and I thought the first thing to do, we've got to find a float, which is as big as we can get it. And as it happens, I think that's a Jaguar float. So that, that's going to help, because when that, when that floats, it's going to float a lot more pressure than a little float like that. So that's it. So now we're going to go and look at my Skiro, which has got a 1,000cc racing jack in it and two beautiful GP carburettors. So we're going to take one to pieces so we can carefully look at it because obviously the angle of the... Um, the angle of that, but obviously the other way round, is very important. And probably Amos did a load of research so we best to copy an aim more, really. Right, well this is my Skiro, four-wheel drive midget racing car, designed by a bloke called Skiro. Um, he made about 50 of them, we think. Um, but this is the only one left that I know of that actually goes. There's a few knocking about without engines and one thing or another, because the engine is such a good thing that unfortunately these cars got broken up because they weren't much use because they're only good for speedway racing and um, obviously a lot of the engines disappeared but luckily this one was complete when I bought it and there you have it beautiful 1000cc Jap engine produces a load of horsepower and runs on methanol but luckily it's got a GP carburetor and it's got these float poles each side and obviously you can see by all the pipes that it's got two pipes going to each carburetor. And that is to get enough fuel. Getting the flow of fuel is very important. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this float pole to pieces, get the needle out, and then we'll be able to really look at it and design the same thing to go in the other carburetor and I think that will cure the flooding problem and also of course allow a good amount of fuel to go through. So if that car was ever run on methanol we could probably modify it a little bit more and it would have a sufficient flow. So anyway I now go and get some spanners and whip this to bits. 
Right, so we're going to strip this down. a secret to being able to adjust the level. I don't know how we'll do that yet, but we'll think of something. And then we'll undo it under here. Pull that off. Now this is the important bit. See that little bit there? What happens is that is the bit that comes up and closes the fuel off. And that is the bit we're going to have to make. And I thought that angle could be very important. Because, you know, um, Amor would have been in business for donkey's years, so they would have worked that out, the best angle possible. So I think that's why we've gone to this trouble. And then obviously that goes in there. And you've got these little... Well, as it happens, this has only got one, but very often they have several of those so that you can raise and lower the float level. And that just jams onto there. So obviously there's no mechanism now. That just goes up and closes on the thing. A job to wear, you know? I mean, this car's 1936, so that one looks like brand new. And nothing can vibrate more than a V-twin. So I think if we follow that principle, we're going to have a very good success. And it's very similar to what I did with the Bugatti carburetor. But that's another story, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. <coughs> right. So we're going to use that as the float. So somehow we're going to have to make something to go on the top of the carburetor so that we can replicate that. When we make the thing that goes inside there, that goes up and down, we'll make it so that it's got several things so we can adjust the float level by altering the height of that. We'll just leave that mechanism there completely out because that won't do anything. And then what will happen with our new system, that will come up, poke through there, and then this is the one out of this carburetor, but obviously we're going to have to alter it, but that will go in there like that. That will be on there. Obviously it has to be made longer. And obviously again, and then obviously we're going to put something on there and then that will poke through there. So that's the system we're going to adopt. And hopefully that will cure it from flooding and work into the future. Because as you can see, that's in lovely condition. When I last used this car, it was at um, Chateau Impney. I drove it up the hill. Unfortunately, the magneto went wrong, which is a bit of a shame because I just had it rebuilt. But what happened was one of the screws fell out. When we brought it back from um, Chateau Impney, we had to drain all the methanol out because it's dodgy old stuff, methanol. It sort of attacks every bit of metal if it can. So we drained it all out and then we sprayed duck oil on everything. And that's the first time I've taken it to pieces, so I'm pretty happy that it's all in lovely condition, so hopefully it'll be the same inside the engine, round the piston rings, etc. So anyway, that's it really for now, and the next thing to do is to manufacture these bits, which old John will probably do, because he's good on the old lathe and bits like that.
So we've altered the main thing here that where the fuel goes in, and we've made the tapered um, needle valve, and then we've joined it to the Jaguar float with like a little aluminium spacer, and then we drilled a hole in the thing and put a pin in it, and, and to get the float level right, we just make up new ones of them, that little spacer. I mean, obviously, you could put washers under it, but, you know, we just make it up, because we could make something that's fitted to the float, but in my experience, the minute you touch a float, it starts to leak, sink, and you have nothing but trouble. So all this modification's been done without altering anything, really. That goes on there. That screws on there. So now to flood it, all you do, you just push that down to flood it. And obviously the, the valve's in there now, so it's got no mechanism at all. All it's got is direct thing. We've just had it on the car and the float level was a bit high. So John's made up a bit of a spacer. And as far as I'm concerned, I think that's gonna be good. Hopefully we fixed the flooding. We put in the uh, our redesigned um, valve and um, what do you call it? Float. And uh, it doesn't leak now. So hopefully we'll give it a run. Right, we've done the carburetor, we've got it back on, and I've actually switched the fuel on, and as you can see, it isn't leaking. Well, I'm not saying it's perfection, but it, um, it's a million times better than it was. So, um, now we'll start the engine again, and um, we're gonna just check the timing with a strobe stomach light so that um, we've got some idea what, you know, what it is. Right, so here we go.
that was just a quick Samson video. But as you probably don't know, I'm a bit of a Mini enthusiast, and I've got a 59 Mini. Um, and we thought next week we'd go around that and point a few bits out, because it really is a very good car. But I've also got a very unique engine, which as far as I know is the only one in the world. And I'm going to drag it out the shed. I haven't got a whole engine, but I've got the block and the head. We're going to drag it out of the shed and then we'll discuss that next week because our next intention is to try and make the bits that are missing and get that engine running. So that will probably be what we'll do next week. 